The views and opinions expressed on Wrestling Wind Down are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. What's up, guys? It's Lo, and you are tuned in to Wrestling Wind Down, a female-founded and hosted podcast dedicated to professional wrestling and our favorite adult beverage. March is recognized as Women's History Month, and I am so excited to have some amazing ladies on during the month of March. On this episode, I am joined by Karen Peterson, who has been a longtime fan of the podcast since the early beginnings. She is also very well-versed in Joshi wrestling, something that a lot of people, including myself, have found interest in lately. Karen is spilling all the wine on all things Joshi, including recommendations on where to start as a new fan and some WWE superstars that have been involved in Joshi Wrestling. She'll also talk about her love of wrestling and how the early days of NXT really helped build her love of the sport. We'll also talk about how she's been an influential part of building a community of Japanese and English-speaking fans, as well as her time that she spent in Japan and the things that she learned along the way. So grab your glass of wine. We're going in for the three count. what I believe is a Joshi expert here, Karen Peterson. Welcome to Wrestling Wind Down. How are you? I am wonderful. I've been looking forward to this so much since I like DM'd you about it. I was very excited to finally do. I've done a lot of wrestling podcasts lately, but none that are hosted by women. So I was like, you know what? I need to change that, especially because I've we've been following each other for a while now. I was like, you know what? Trying to rip off that Band-Aid, try to put myself out there, try to make some friends <laughs> that, that are female content creators. Yes, we love other female content creators. I'm so glad to have you here. When did you become a professional wrestling fan? It's a very long story because for me, I started watching wrestling back in... 1999 when I was in university back in the WWF attitude area the very first WWE pay-per-view I saw was no mercy it was the Terry Reynolds invitational it was Mm. Edge and Christian and the Hardy Boys on a ladder and I was like I don't know what all of this handsome hair and everything is doing but I want to know more and it kind of just spiraled from there (laughs) So I got to watch the Monday Night Wars unfold in real time. But also at that time I was in university, I was a woman's stu- like, I was doing a women's studies minor. So I was having a lot of conflicting issues of being someone, you know, who's 19 going on 20, struggling with body image, the expectations of women, what WWF and WCW at the time, what they were export, what their desired images of women were. <laughs> and when I left for Japan in 2003, I stopped watching wrestling because at that point, WCW had been bought out, ECW had been bought out, it's been all consolidated, and I just kind of lost interest because I was focused on moving to Japan. I was in Japan for five and a half years, and the part I was in, there wasn't any wrestling that ever came through, so I didn't watch any wrestling oh my while God. I was there. And I I would see like like the magazines and like the gir- like the the convenience stores and the bookshops and I I would be like mm, I don't know I don't know and I I kick myself these years later because I could have been on the you know the day one for Shinsuke Nakamura I could have been on day one for Asuka day one for Kairi Sane Io Shirai and I missed all of that <laughs> but then did a couple of jobs. Uh, in different careers started watching again like 2011 ish because I was working at a boarding school so Monday nights I was on call I'd throw on Monday Night Raw kind of half watched it really didn't follow it that was you know during the Divas era yes still having the trauma of the Attitude era the Divas era was always difficult for me to watch just because I still had that you know 10 years later that lingering resentment of stereotypes and everything else but it was around 2014, uh, October, November, I went to my very first NXT house show. Fell in love because the main event was had Sami Zayn, Neville against Finn Balor and a debuting Hideo Itami. Wow. And that was the end of it for me. Finn and Hideo, now Kenta, won the main event. They went around the ring. Kenta stopped it with me. I took a picture with him. And the rest was the rest history. Is history. <laughs> I, I, I would watch NXT every single week. I... Finally, in 2016, I managed to win some free tickets the second night of the Cruiserweight Classic in full sale. That changed my life because I was like, after experiencing that version of NXT, because we talked about it a little bit right before we started, 
that NXT was my NXT, the mm -hmm. NXT I loved. And then as a result, I got to see, again, Shinsuke debut. I got to see Asuka debut. I got to go to both Mae Young Classics. Absolutely amazing. I couldn't go to Evolution, but being at the Mae Young Classics really, really did it for me. And then, uh, what was it? 2017, I started at that time watching both. We were getting ready for WrestleMania here in Orlando. So I started learning a little bit about British wrestling and, you know, that's when they had the NXT UK tournament. Mm -hmm. So they were preparing to bring, signing all those guys and bringing them all over. And I was one of those people who was like team no sleep during Orlando Mania. Oh my God. Went to as many shows <laughs> as I could, tried to learn everything I could about everything. Sh destroyed my voice for about a month. I was sick for about a month afterwards. <laughs> but as a result, I watched at the time, it was a promotion in Northern England called WCPW, and they did a pro wrestling World Cup where they had different brackets of wrestlers from all these different countries, and one of them was a Japan bracket. In the Japan bracket, it had Kushida, who would go on to win the entire tournament, but it had a bunch of New Japan juniors in it. It had Jushin Thunder Liger, it had Bushi, it had Risuke Taguchi, Sho and Yo, before they went back to Japan and debuted as graduating from their tra trainee program learning excursion to where they are now and from that point on, i was like oh maybe i'll finally start watching new japan the mistake i made <laughs> was that immediately after this tournament the first new japan like tournament series i decided to watch was the g1 the g1, oh gosh is that it, the one that airs like very late at night it, or well, into the wee more hours of the morning most of them do but it is a like month long multi city 20 something stop tour. Oh my God. <laughs> With the time zone change, like for East Coast US, it's a 13 hour time change between here and Tokyo. Winter time, when we have daylight savings, is abysmal because it's a 14 hour time change. So, you know, when it's summertime, no problem. 5 30 wake up. I wake up at 5 30 anyway because I have to go to work for my real job that pays my bills. Winter time where it's like a 3.30 in the morning start or a 2.30 in the morning start. I'm like, you know what? I'll catch it after I get a full night of sleep. I'll put a pot of coffee on. I'll make some pancakes and that'll be it. The problem for me is that that G1 also overlapped with the busiest time of the year at the university I work at, which is new student orientation. I really, truly messed up at that time. Oh my gosh. I can't even imagine. You've seen a lot of wrestlers. You've seen Japanese wrestlers. You've seen, you know, the likes of Finn Balor, Sami Zayn, Asuka, etc. Out of all of the people that you've seen live, who have been some of your favorites to watch? Who has captivated you? In the ring? Yes. Well, of course, Asuka, Kairi Sain, Io Shirai. You can't go wrong with any of them, especially after Kairi won the first Mae Young Classic. He was a finalist in the second. Hands down, those three, they have history in Japan prior to coming to the U.S. And it's all great. Some of it's like a, you do a little bit of a deep dive to dig around. During the second Mae Young Classic, I discovered the amazement and awe and splendor that is Meiko Satomura. And to the point where I, you know, I learned about that there was a promotion in northern Japan called Sendai Girls, which she started, and that's like her promotion. She had to actually sign it over to someone else when she finally signed her NXT UK contract because she couldn't keep her own promotion. Oh, wow. But, when, but whenever she's back in back in Japan, she's back up in Sendai training with the girls and, you know, hanging out in the, the race fields because that that dojo and that, like, their like, training area is mm -hmm. literally in the middle of nowhere. They do PR and they do, like, community building and they go to all the local shops and everything, but they actually help, like, harvest rice in their community. I know, right? Because it's, they do, they care about their area so much. And Sendai is in Miyagi Prefecture, which is very close to where the Tohoku earthquake was in mm. 2011. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it was, it was March 11th, 2011. So coming up next month, or during Women's History Month, it'll be the the anniversary of that as well. So hopefully they'll let Sendai Girls always tries to do something special around that time. So if there is something, it's early enough before Mania time for that they could let her go back home and do something about it. But yeah, Mako Satomura changed my life. And when they finally managed, I don't know how many boats of money they sent to her to lock her down and convince her to go to NXT UK, but 
it it was very much worth it. And you know, the May Young class, both May Young classics. If I would think the people who follow wrestling wind down have seen the May Young classics and or evolution. Mm-hmm. And there's just so many different talented women that have gone through both of those tournaments and that, you know, that pay-per-view that have either started in Japan or when they were really young, went over to Japan, maybe didn't necessarily have a very, like a very high profile training time, but a lot of the current WWE women's wrestling landscape that aren't wrestlers who were trained from the ground up in the PC have some kind of roots in Japanese wrestling and Japanese strong style. So let me ask you this. Why do you think WWE doesn't really spotlight that? It's interesting because back when Finn first got signed and Shinsuke got signed and Asuka got signed, it was a big deal, especially with Finn, Asuka, and Kenta because they came in and they changed their names because Finn was Fergal Devitt. Mm -hmm. That's how he built his name in New Japan. They brought him over. But of course, you know, WWE wants to trademark it. So they like, they're like, pick something that's kind of close to what you had, <laughs> but special enough that we can get a cut of the money. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Kenta. They changed it to Hideo Itami. He kind of just went with it. Same thing with Asuka. You know, even with Kairi Sane, she was Kairi Hojo when she was in stardom. She came here and they wanted, I guess they wanted to trademark the insane elbow because her flying elbow drop is absolutely gorgeous. Fine, she went with it. I mean, Shinsuke and uh, Io being able to keep their names, the same thing with Kushida, I feel like what they did was just like flip it. Instead of being Nakamura Shinsuke, which would be his family name first, they mm-hmm. just flopped it to Shinsuke Nakamura. And so the same thing with Io Shirai. Shirai is the family name that she uses as her stage name, and Io is like her given name. So they just kind of flipped it. So Kush- Kushida. <laughs> When he was in New Japan, it was still Kushida, but it was like all capital letters. Now uh-huh. it's like capital K, lowercase. So it's 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 like they try to figure, they try to pick and choose their way around to keep some of the name power. And I think they learned by changing too many people's names. Right. Some even instances. people, yeah, even people that haven't been in Japan, like yeah. even if they've made a name for themselves here in the United States on the independence, they've been changing their names. Like I know Braun Breaker didn't have independent scene thing but i feel like keeping the steiner name would have just been golden i'm not sure why braun breaker was on the table it's just so weird to me the hardest thing for me about that was that i went to like one or two of the nxt 2.0 teams i'm like i'm like you know what i'll give it a couple of weeks i'll see if i like it my friend and i sat right directly behind beth phoenix for one of the braun breaker like the braun breaker match where he came out and they were you know making the you know all the references he did a steiner recliner and they called it a steiner recliner and i'm right there and i'm like why can't he just use the name they're like it's like the elephant in the room everybody knows and it's the worst kept secret like they're throwing all the steiner tidbits minus the steiner math at him apparently some reports i've read he chose that name to make it close enough to the family name but also unique enough where it's his so he doesn't fall into the same pitfall that, say, Tessa Blanchard or Charlotte mm-hmm. Flair runs into where they're a generational talent. So there's that additional layer of expectation, but also he has an innate desire to carve his own name out. I do want to talk about NXT with you. So you mentioned that you have been watching NXT for so many years now, yeah. and we know that they've had this big rebrand. They've kind of done out with the old and in with the new. How does it make you feel to see them kind of start with a clean slate you know they want to bring in these younger talent that we've heard rumors that they don't really want to go with older talent or more experienced talent now how does it make you feel as a longtime fan to see that i understand some of the reasoning as to why they did it however i think they did it to somewhat compete with other companies that are also doing a lot of young talent programs not necessarily on broadcast television such as AEW dark that are bringing in lesser known indie names To my knowledge, I don't think they're training anyone from ground zero up. I don't think so. But it's, as somebody who's been to multiple NXT takeovers, I mean, memorable NXT takeovers, like when Aleister Black finally won the belt and when Kyrie finally defeated Shayna, like it's, that was my NXT. Andrade and Johnny Gargano, beautiful match. Those were my takeovers. Those were also like, we got samples of that here in Florida on the house show loop. They would always make this effort to pair the more veteran wrestlers, especially because, you know, there was 
and they still do they either train people from zero but at the time that i was like really into nxt it was they signed they drained the indies they drained the uk indies they poached from the australian indies they smothered a lot of scenes and just like started for lack of a better term hoarding talent Mm -hmm. especially after the cruiserweight classic and the may young classics the uk tournaments they just started grabbing every single person and signing everybody up stardom it was actually one of the promotions that suffered the most because nxt and nxt uk signed so many of their foreign wrestlers that were while they were still kind of finishing out their contracts in stardom and in the uk scene they couldn't wrestle other wrestlers that weren't contracted to nxt or to WWE. So it all all of a sudden the promotions were that where they made their names they weren't able to do the matches they were used to doing. So when you think of like foreigners that were training abroad at the time, B Priestley finally got signed and now she's Blair Davenport at NXT UK. Tony Storm in Stardom, her and B Priestley were two of the highest decorated foreign wrestlers on the Stardom roster, especially after the first May Young class they just stripped so many all of those women that had and and men of course that had prior wrestling experience those were the ones that were not i don't want to use the phrase carrying but those were the ones that were dictating the pace in the matches they were mm-hmm. they were the ones that because they have that history and they have that foundation they mm-hmm. know when they can do something on the fly if something doesn't go right or you know if a wrestler is still trying to figure something out they have the wherewithal and the knowledge base and the foundation to make them look good Mm -hmm. And it was different before, you know, AEW started taping or broadcasting live and NXT had to start broadcasting live weekly. When NXT was prior to going live, it was once a month. It was a four and a half to five hour block, 19 matches, almost no ring promos. I mean, we watched a lot of wrestling those days. There were times (laughs) where it was like when they would go on the road for like to go to like the Europe tour for like two weeks or go over to Asia or to down to Australia. And it'd be like two nights back to back. It's a lot of wrestling. I mean, it was like, you know, an eight hour day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was the thing is that you had all of these great indie talents that helped elevate NXT to the level where people were like, NXT is the A show. It's better than Raw. It's better than SmackDown. It's, it's not developmental anymore. It's on the same level. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what happened to where they had this impetus where all of a sudden 30 is too old for women. I'm 42 and I'm living my best life right now. Just so we're clear. I'm a little 42 girl. <laughs> I drink my water and I stay in my own lane. That's the that's how it works. But you know, like Trish Stratus, Lita, they're in their 40s. They're doing fine. Beth Phoenix. Whew. It's frustrating because so many of these women and the women now in NXT that are at that 30, that have been there for a few years, like... Raquel Gonzalez, she's around 30. Io Shirai is around 30. Io personally should have gone up to Maine about a year and a half ago after she lost the title the first time. But, mm-hmm, you know, I agree. They, they, they wanted to keep a baby face or tweener that could, I hate to use the phrase, carry the brand as they were transitioning into this new version of NXT. Mm-hmm. One of the things that frustrates me as a fan is I was there when Mandy Rose debuted. I was there the entire time Mandy Rose was in NXT and I watched her leave to go to Maine to be in Maine for several years before coming back and becoming the NXT women's champion within a month of coming back for what? What are your thoughts on these superstars that have been on the main roster coming back to NXT? I know you just mentioned Mandy Rose, but we've seen Dolph Ziggler. We've seen AJ Styles. And these are older superstars. These are not what they say they're looking for in these younger superstars lately. They're bringing back some of these older talents to come in NXT and almost have these younger superstars show them what they're working with. The thing is, is that there are other, you know, like, for example, Ember Moon. Mm -hmm. Everyone went to Maine. They weren't using her. They brought her back. She was great. We missed her. We were like, girl, come back, come back home. And that that was the the attitude we had about a a lot of the NXT graduates that would go up and then wouldn't be used. Like we were begging them to send the 205 Live guys back. Mm -hmm. Like give us, give us all of them back. If you're not going to use them or utilize them because there's just so much talent. Uh, Alistair Black was another one. We we're just like, send him back. Mm-hmm. Cesaro, we didn't care. We were just, we just wanted anyone and everyone to come back. Right. But the problem is, is that in the last year and a half with the pandemic, they released so many people from NXT. And a lot of the people they released were those that had prior indie experience 
that held that brand together after every WrestleMania when they would carve out swaths of talent. Like Mia Yim, we, I was there. I was in the crowd when they were chanting for Triple H to sign Mia Yim. We, we all had tears in our eyes because she deserves the world. Her and Mercedes Martinez. Like, I, it still puzzles me as to how they fumbled so badly with those two. Like, I mentioned it a while ago on the podcast. Oh, I agree. Like, I remember reading about them when I had first started getting into wrestling and I saw they were on the indies and I was like, oh my God, is WWE ever going to sign them? Then you finally sign them and you put them in this group where they're wearing masks the whole time and they barely wrestle. Make it make sense. And that's the problem. There was so much of that make it make sense. And unfortunately, the problem is they signed so much talent, but they weren't giving enough of them a platform Mm -hmm. or to, you know, present them like some of them it was like you sign these people for who they are as a wrestler before coming to wwe and then you start changing everything about them that was the reason you signed them to begin with like for me i don't know if you if you watched nxt closely enough at that time but tmdk or tm61 Mm -hmm. one of the best tag teams in the world they were signed right after kenta was signed away from pro wrestling noah they are australian but they were you know they were up with jonah or jonah rock and zack saber jr they were all over in the noah dojo making names for themselves in japan racking up titles after titles after titles and then they brought them into nxt and because they are so talented they get paired with a lot of the wrestlers. like i had to watch shane blow out his knee during one dusty only to come back after his surgery and they bi- started building them up like all oh, tmdk's finally come back and everyone's like oh they're gonna find they're gonna finally put the belts on them it's gonna be great and then the first round of the second dusty they jobbed them out to authors of pain right before authors of pain went up to the main roster and i was like you make did it all make the- sense you did all that build up you gave the whole talk about how shane finished the tour went to australia to do the australia tour with a busted knee before going for surgery and it was like packaged right there they were in the pc back when dusty was still there then that was the frustrating thing because that's what nxt started becoming is that the talent that had experience prior were the ones that were making the pc homegrowns look good very good Mm. there are other names i could name but i might save that t for when we're off air because there's (laughs) i i'll get fired up and you know i have friends that still work there and i don't want anyone to get in trouble (laughs) but it's just one of those things where it just breaks my heart because there there are so many people that, you know, I still don't understand how Candice LeRae hasn't been NXT Women's Champion. That is they, another they, story for another time. I, I definitely agree with you. I We'll, have, we'll, we'll have to meet again for this because I've yes, got, I got feelings on it. I have so many feelings. <laughs> I mean, just to wrap that part up, like, I remember probably what like a year and a half ago having a conversation with someone and being like wouldn't it be something if wwe were to have candace LeRae start like the intergender wrestling in their company she's the perfect person to do all of that she's done it before it would be amazing and her you know, husband kind of works for, there kind of for a while there it seemed like they were kind of like trying to test the waters out they did a mixed match and she went face to face with the other guy it seemed like after that they were kind of like no we're not doing that there was an nxt house show that i went to in nashville and mm-hmm. the main event was johnny and candace against andrade and zelina and it was amazing and it kills me that they never put that on a takeover because that money money does wwe not like money like the, these are money this is money <laughs> You wouldn't be firing people with all the money you would be making from these people. I need that as a GIF. <laughs> this, me, me being just very angry. <laughs> for, for those who, who don't, uh, you know, we'd be listening to the audio version. I have my hands like a, a little angry Italian grandma and I'm just like <laughs> waving them violently at how like, like making the little money sign being like, do you not like money? I'm sorry. There's just so much emotional investment I've had in NXT over the last seven years that when they moved to the 2.0 format, after a year and a half of culling their roster and watching people scramble for their lives, especially international talent that Mm -hmm. are here on work visas that have to worry about either finding a new place to sponsor their visa or scramble to move home before they get deported. It's kind of like a really bad breakup. Like you have all this emotional investment. It's like a loss of a friendship. And it's like, you don't know what to do. It's like, do I still like NXT? I mean, I have friends that work there and I have some of my favorite wrestlers still wrestle there but I'm not fighting to get on the list to get into the venue anymore. 
I'd rather watch it from home with my, you know, my dog and my bottle of wine and call it a night. And it, unfortunately, and I hate to say it th this way, what they've done to NXT now, you're not going to sell out a Mania Weekend takeover. Girl, they aren't going to sell out Mania Takeover anyway because they're having it at 11 a.m. Well, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, that was the segue I was going with. It's, it's like you, you brunch during NXT. It's NXT brunch over. You nap for about five hours, then you go through 12 hours of WrestleMania that night. God bless the people in Texas that are going to be going to that show and trying to do it all, like the, the double header. I wish you the best of luck. I was ready to do it until I found out it was 11 a.m. in the morning and you think, oh, OK, it'll probably be like uh, maybe two or three hours. And then you have to go back. If you don't want to wear the same outfit to WrestleMania, go back, get ready again, then head back out. And who knows how long WrestleMania is a mess. A mess. And also, you have to worry about, you know, if you're not from Dallas and you don't know what the weather is like in April, are you have to take an extra shower because it's really, really hot? Is it a dry heat? Is it humid heat? It's just it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I'd rather just you know, get a couple of the streaming packages and just watch it at home and be like, I mean, don't leave me wrong. I love going to Mania Week. But the one thing that I always loved was that TakeOver was a step. It felt a equal to Raw and SmackDown after Mania because it was still at that 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock time slot. 11 o'clock on the morning of Mania, some people are still recovering from the midnight shows the night before. Right. Or they're going drunk and it's fine. I mean, but it's just... It's not my NXT anymore, and it makes me so sad. So incredibly sad. Hey, listeners of Wrestling Wind Down. I'm Meridian Fierro, co host and co creator of Rest Friends. We are your wrestling friends, your wrestling best friends. We're a podcast and YouTube channel. Every week, alongside my amazing co host and cousin, Teddy, we talk about WWE, AEW, New Japan, and everything trending in the world of wrestling. And over on our YouTube channel, we have vlogs, reactions, and recaps. You can find the Rest Friends podcast on all streaming platforms and subscribe to our Rest Friends channel on YouTube. Los esperamos ahí. We have all the chisme. Now, back to Wrestling Wind Down. Speaking of WWE, you had the opportunity to research and narrate a canvas to canvas video with the talented artist Rob Schamberger. How did this opportunity come along? And what did you think of the final project? Rob and his wife, Katie, are good friends of mine. When I first bought my house in 2015, it was my, it's my very first house. My goal was I wanted to do a kind of some wrestling decor that didn't make it look like a, a teenage boy's bedroom. And I say this as I have a, a wall of stuffed animals and, you know, podcast t-shirts hanging off the back of my chair right now. But I started buying some of Rob's prints. And as I would buy different prints and I would like tweet them at, tweet at them and be like, look, I finally framed it. And I would get really excited. And then it was right before leading up to Mania here in Orlando in 2017. So I put all my prints in, in my little folio because I was going to, you know, go to Access, I was going to get the talent to sign it. And I stopped by his booth, finally met him and his wife in person. And like the rest is history. We just became friends over the years and, you know, I'd buy his stuff, he'd promote my stuff. But back in 2019, when Kyrie went up to the main roster and there was the debut of the Kabuki Warriors, there was that awkward um, having Paige as the English speaking mouthpiece for two Japanese talents with absolutely no explanation as to why Asuka, multi time champion, longest reigning NXT champion, and Kyrie Sane, former NXT champion, May Young Classic winner, why they were all of a sudden being thrown together as a tag team when they've both built their careers in WWE. WWE as singles wrestlers. I did a little research at that time to find out one, why they were being called the Kabuki Warriors, because as presented with no explanation, let alone any explanation by either Asuka or Kyrie, whether it was a video package or, you know, saying that it was their own choice, it took Asuka and Kyrie going to, onto social media afterwards and seeing the backlash because. Very few people know about the lesser known meaning of the word kabuki. When people think, most Western people think of the word kabuki, they think of the, the no style theater or the performance art. I thought of the makeup brush. Or the makeup brush. And that's the impact, like, why, why are you calling them that? But in Japanese feudal history, you know, during the warring states times where it was, you know, they were starting to open the ports and Western Westernization and colonization was coming to Japan they there was you know kind of like the outlaw samurai would who would take their kimono and make them look really flashy and like they would call them kabuki kimono because it was a different meaning in which they were presenting themselves in a very vibrant and colorful way to stand mm. out 
And when we talk about stardom, but there is a wrestler in stardom whose name is Unagi Sayaka, and she is the the wild kabuki mono. Same same concept because her costume is very similar to Asuka. Lots of mismatched patterns that are very vibrant, fur everywhere. And but that's that's the thing is that it's more of a celebration of the not the performance art, but the uh, kimono culture of, of, of a former time. When Rob was tapped to finally do the canvas to canvas for the Kabuki Warriors, he's like, you speak Japanese. I've seen you talk about it before. Can you write a two minute piece? And I was like, all right, I'll write it and I'll send it over to you. And he's like, and can you narrate it? And I'm like, you want me to what now? <laughs> because i like i love his series of, of canvas to canvas and i was like i'll do it and he's like he's like well I'll give you the best piece of advice somebody gave me i'm like what's that rob he's like don't f it up and i'm like no pressure <laughs> the experience was very easy because you know it, it wasn't i didn't have to write like an 18 page essay on it it was just like a little blurb enough to just fill a, a time slot on his video but it was one of those things having lived in japan and currently being in a job where i don't have Japanese connection directly through my employment. My career path uh, up until about 2015, when I started my current job, there was either Japanese boarding school. I worked for Delta as a Japanese speaking flight attendant. I was based in Hawaii. I, you know, I lived and taught in Japan. So I had like all of that. And then like, when I started living here in Orlando, wrestling was the way I got my Japanese culture fixed without being able to fly back to Japan. So when Canvas to Canvas got released in November of 2019, it was like, we were there for brunch. I remember because I was at my parents' house. My sister was getting ready to celebrate her 40th birthday. So she wasn't going to be there for Thanksgiving because she was a Thanksgiving baby. But the canvas to canvas dropped while we were in the middle of brunch. So my mom's like, I told my mom about that I was doing this this big secret video. It sucked. I couldn't tell any of my friends about it. I was like, I wanted to tell everyone. I'm like, mm, mm, ah. <laughs> but I told my mom because I tell my mom everything. And she's like, well, go grab your laptop. Let's watch the video. And my parents have tried to be supportive of my life in Japan, my time in Japan. My wanting, I'm like constantly, like I left my heart there. I keep wanting to go back all the time. Mm -hmm. But when they watched Rob's video, by the time we finished it, my mom's like, I think you need to go back. Even if it's just for vacation, I think you need to go back. Like it, it was hard because it helped them understand that like I have all of these connections and that, you know, in my mind, I do have unfinished business in Japan, but that led to them. But surprising me for Christmas, they bought me a ticket to go to Japan so I could go to Wrestle Kingdom and meet friends I hadn't I had only known online through wrestling. Mm -hmm. I got to fulfill some promises I had to friends. I was like, I will see New Japan in Japan one day. I will see stardom in person one day. And Rob's video helped that make that possible because it helped my family get a better understanding of why I love wrestling so much. So you shared with me that you are fluent in Japanese and it has helped you to build relationships between English speaking and Japanese speaking fans. When did you realize that this was a necessity within the wrestling community? One of the things that's a big difference for between the Japanese fan experience and the Western fan experience is that in Japan, Meet and greets tend to be, uh, you have to either be their fan club member or you have to buy merchandise, a specific mm. merchandise for, for a specific wrestler. Mm -hmm. It's not like tables and tables of everybody there. It's maybe one person or maybe two if you're lucky. But when uh, Festival of Honor happened in 2019, right before the G1 Supercard at Madison Square Garden, and one of the most popular factions in New Japan is Los Ingo Barnables de Japón. LIJ is considered a tweener slash heel faction in Japan. Japanese fans in Japan never, ever, ever get to meet and greet with this stable of people. Ring of Honor convinced New Japan to let them sell a meet and greet with all five members because at the time Hiromu was out with his, his neck injury. So there were six members, but like Hiromu was like on the shelf of Los Ingo Bernardes de Japón. So people, of course, all these Western fans are posting these pictures where they're standing in the middle with like, they got Shingo Takagi on one side and Naito on the other. And everyone's just like, they like, of course, the Japanese fans are expressing their excitement. But, you know, I don't want to use the phrase jealousy. Maybe some of them were jealous, but a lot of them are just like, oh, that's so nice. We never get that ex experience. But of course, Google Translate and Twitter Translate, it's just like, oh, I'm jealous. Oh, it mm. must be nice. And it was like fans started getting snippety with each other about it. And then like two days after the day of WrestleMania, uh, Tama Tonga and the Bullet Club had the Bullet Club block party. Bullet Club's a massive heel faction from New Japan. 
they don't get meet and greets with the wrestlers that are heels in New Japan. But because, you know, Tama threw this big event, sold tickets for all the wrestlers. So people are like getting pictures with Jay White. Like uh, I bought the VIP package then. I have like a, it's, it looks like a class photo. It's like the entire Bullet Club and me in the middle just being like, eh, hey, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I got Tama on one side and Jay White and the other. And everyone's just like, how did you score that photo? I'm like, well, one, it wasn't cheap. <laughs> Let's be honest. But the other thing is, is that, again, it's an opportunity that they don't have in Japan. So it's trying to help being someone who can help bridge the language gap and explain. You get the opportunity to meet wrestlers in your favorite promotions, either for free or for very cheap and very frequently. We get those opportunities maybe once every few months or something like the Bullet Club Block Party or the you know Madison Square Garden show for New Japan or Ring of Honor once in a lifetime. We, we don't get that frequency that they get. Even WWE, too, like you think about access, like it might happen like two or three times a year. But if you're meeting a superstar, it's like by chance, you know, whether it's at like a restaurant or something like that. I hope people are not lurking on these superstars at their hotels. That's a whole nother story. Again, (laughs) another episode. We'll have it. We'll unpack that one. If you see people and then that's things, if you see somebody at the airport or like, you know, at the grocery store. Just, just let them be like unless you can't reach them on the shelf and be like hey would you mind grabbing that for me and be like thanks i'm a fan and like walk off that's fine right but again but the same thing with access it's the vips are like you know several hundred dollars you have to make sure that you're able to get to snap one up before all the resellers get it and sell it for five times the price and then if you have only the general access one you can be in line for two hours to meet alexa bliss and like right when you get to the front of the line they swap it out for someone maybe that's not alexa bliss that you did not want to wait two hours for the good thing about it for me was that being bilingual one it gave me another reason to keep studying because i was having to constantly think how do i translate this from english to japanese or japanese to english because you know i was very fluent when i lived over there but now that i'm in a job where i don't use it every day i'm not surrounded by it every day i have to constantly seek out avenues and outlets where i can get that input and get that output and that's why i watch a lot of japanese wrestling i'll i'll listen to the english commentary when i you know when it's available but i'll throw the japanese commentary on because my listening comprehension has gone down my ability to speak has gone down doing everything on computer i can't i write like a kindergartner again and it's the most frustrating thing it's like those language skills you don't use them you lose them so for me wrestling became another avenue where i can study and enjoy it like I watch anime again which I haven't watched like I didn't watch anime for years but I started watching anime again because now like you know all the streaming platforms have different ones and I'm like you know Mm -hmm. what maybe I'm not invested in the story but at least I'm working on my listening skills again I feel like I'm back in school again I'll put on the English subtitles and I'll listen to the Japanese and I'll flip flop it I'll, I'll recite it back you know it's just one of those things where because there's so few of us not that I feel like morally obligated to be this great savior and bridge between the two fandoms But it's just something where it's an opportunity to create a wider community where people have a better understanding of each other. What is the feedback that you've received from being that almost like a liaison for the English speaking and the Japanese speaking fans? Have you gotten good feedback? Has there been any negative feedback that you can think of? Well, most of it's been good because I try to explain it politely. I don't want to be like, hey, don't be a jerk. I think one of the more difficult and taxing times when Hana Kimura passed because there was a lot of information being thrown out in Japanese and a lot of wrestlers were tweeting about it. And again, same thing, Google Translate, machine translation. Mm -hmm. Even if you were trying to very formally say things in Japanese, it was butchering. Yeah, I had noticed that too. Mm -hmm. So, So, but it became a very emotionally draining week for me because I basically spent the like almost every single day, full all day, just just translating everything I could just because I wanted to help with the understanding. I wanted to help with the healing. But it was hard because some people started treating me like Google Translate. They would say like people I don't know would start DMing me things and being like, hey, what does this mean? And I'm like, "Uh, I'm kind of busy doing other things right now. And they're like, well, you can't pick and choose who you help. And I'm like, I'm like, well, I have a Patreon, I have a coffee, I have a cash app. If you want to like send me money, I will drop what I'm doing. Even though a lot of the things I was doing at the time were for my Japanese friends who work in the wrestling industry in Japan, trying to convey their emotions in English. So I'm trying to help them express themselves because, you know, they want to say the right thing. They want to, mm-hmm. they also want to help build that those bridges. Right. I hate to say this because I don't, I don't like saying negative things, but I've also been accused of abusing my language ability to get better meet and greets out of people because I can speak to the Japanese talent in Japanese. If you're, for example, if you're doing a meet and greet in your second language 
and you're trying your best to speak English, English, English as much as you can. And you finally get a break for two minutes with someone that could be like, you know what? Turn off your English brain. Let's just bang out some Japanese just so you can like rest. You know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, they're not a good promo because they don't know how to speak English. They speak their native language better than you ever will. Remember, they're doing exactly what everyone else is doing, but in their second language. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not everyone can be Cesaro and be multilingual. It'd be great, but it's also one of those things where it comes down to a you know in foreign language support or English as a second language support for non-native English speaking talent. And that's another thing that people don't understand. It's like just because you get signed to WWE, for example, it doesn't mean that you move here and you show up and they're you know there's they have a rollout sensei in your closet. You're like you're like I'm going to teach you everything about English. No, it is interesting that you say that because I think of I had the opportunity to listen to Renee Young speak before, and she was talking about when she had signed, they had her go through like a almost like a language class. So they told her the way that she was speaking since she was from Canada, they kind of like fine tuned it. And I thought that was really interesting because I'm like, I wonder how many other talents have had this. And then you bring up these Japanese or foreign speaking talent i wonder if they go through that too and it's like that's their second language yeah with renee it's like you know it's just a canadian accent when yeah, you have it, someone that has english as their second language that's a whole different ball game the thing that people are forgetting is that these are adults having to learn another language mm -hmm. when learning language as a kid is easy because you're a sponge when you get older you've got all kinds of stuff going on in yeah. your that you, you don't have time. <laughs> you got to worry about, you know, paying your bills. You got to worry about eating right. You got to make sure you're not like doing the wrong things. So it's just like, you know, plus, you know, they're training full time and traveling, f trying to carve out time to study a, a language. The, the last thing people want to do is study. I mean, I love studying and there are days where I'm just like, you know what? It's Animal Crossing for this girl today. I'm not doing anything productive and that's okay. It's just one of those things where I want us as a fan base to be more understanding and supportive and also use less racially insensitive comments at wrestlers because I've been at some shows where I've heard the most appalling things said offensive offensive mm -hmm. offensive racial comments mm -hmm. very sexist very inappropriate comments especially and there are children there yep parroting it because they hear dad say it so they're like i'm gonna give that a go no 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 stop it be better be don't be garbage be better people at the end of the day wrestlers are people they are not animals in a petting zoo don't touch Preach. them leave Preach. them alone i'm gonna get my angry hands out again for you <laughs> <laughs> It's like on TikTok where they have like the little teeny tiny hands. That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> it's just common sense. Like you wouldn't say like a lot of the things I've heard people say to wrestlers, especially the ones where English is their second language. Mm -hmm. They they assume the wrestler doesn't understand, understand what they're saying. To them. Yeah. It's the whole one apple spoils the whole barrel. Absolutely. And it's honestly, it's usually white men. It sounds about white. Yeah. That's what it usually is white middle aged men or older men that are like, well, he's a grandpa. Give him a pat. No. No, I almost got into a fight with an old man out in Coco because he was he was making Pearl Harbor comments and mm -hmm. uh, at Kyrie saying, and I'm like, bro, she may not care what you're what you're saying because she's busy, you know, wrestling. But you can catch these hands. They may not be Braun Strowman hands, but I'm short and I'm fast. Kicking the kneecaps. Oh my god! Sorry, my 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 my, my New Jersey, my Miami are showing. I might need to put those away. You are a huge fan of Joshi wrestling. Joshi has become increasingly popular in the last couple of years, but there's still a large segment of the wrestling world that's unfamiliar. What exactly is Joshi? So Joshi, for those who don't know, is the designator for women. Or girls. So Joshi wrestling is women's wrestling. Now, for those who watched the Tokyo Olympic last year, you may have noticed, if you happen to catch some of the Japanese commentary, that they also use the phrase danshi, which is men's or boys. But that's not used in wrestling because men and men's wrestling is just pro wrestling or wrestling. Mm. But women's wrestling is specifically Joshi. Now, typically, the, the nomenclature for Joshi spe is speaking about the Japanese women's wrestling scene as a whole. Mm -hmm. But it can also mean you can call someone like in Japan, they have the term Joshi Kokose, which is high school girl. It's one of those things like where you're a Joshi, I'm a Joshi, we love wrestling. So there's the phrase Pujoshi, which is like women who like professional wrestling. Oh. Yes. 
for all the lady fans, you are you two are Joshi. You were a Joshi fan. So when did you first discover Joshi? Was it before you went to Japan? No, it was. Oh, it it was Kyrie saying Mm. they made a big deal about her getting signed and debuting. And at the time they dropped the name Stardom. And I'm like, I need to know more about this because at the time Stardom, it had a following back in 2017. But I didn't I didn't know how to sign up for Stardom World. I didn't know who was who and what was what. But when we talked about how the WWE kind of casually mentions, but kind of glosses over wrestlers history prior to coming into the company. Yeah. The thing was that a lot of the women they had in the Mae Young Classic had been in stardom or had done other wrestling in Japan. So you had, you know, you have your Kairi Sains and your Io Shirai's who, you know, they are Japanese women who got their start wrestling in Japan. Saray is another one. But you also have people like Dakota Kai. She wrestled in stardom. Santana Garrett, she wrestled in stardom. Mia Yim went over to Japan. Tegan Knox, as Nick Newell, went over there. Tony Storm, Shayna Baszler wrestled in stardom. Oh, so I didn't a lot know of, that. Yes. So it's one of those things where sometimes it's cute because sometimes when Kyrie will tweet at Shayna or Shayna will tweet at Kyrie, they won't post their WWE matches. They'll like put a little clip, it, like little gifts of their time in stardom, mm. which is like a deep cut because they, oh, they look like little babies. It's so cute. But it's just one of those things where a lot of the influence in current WWE, like a lot of the popular women's wrestlers, they don't need to be Japanese to be Joshi. Rachel Ellering went over to stardom. Stevie Turner, who was who's in NXT UK, she went over into stardom. She was part of the stable that belonged to Hana Kimura when mm-hmm. Hana passed away. So her character in NXT UK, she actually does Hana's finger guns as part of her entrance. And the first time she did it, and it, Nigel McGuinness mentioned on commentary, Hana and the Tokyo Cyber Sky friends around the world were all like they were losing their mind because one, you know, we made people miss Hana, but at the same time, it was someone carrying on that legacy outside of stardom. It was giving it a bigger platform. So yeah, Kyrie saying getting signed by WWE was kind of the impetus. But then the more I kind of like started deep diving, I would go into stardom and like find I'm like, I'm like, wait, Chelsea Green was in stardom? Okay, I'm learning so much. <laughs> like, like, I mean, you can pull up their Wikipedia, the Stardom roster Wikipedia page, mm-hmm. like an alumni section. Jazzy Gabbert was the World of Stardom champion, which is their their top champion. So it's one of those things where it's it's there, but if you don't look for it, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know it, and that's unfortunately in part to how they were presented in the May Young Classic because one, I think they would have op- been openly mean that they poached a lot of Stardom's talent with the understanding that, oh no, we're just going to borrow them for this little tournament and kind of give them back. But they didn't really, you know, they borrowed the toys and then just kind of forgot to return a lot of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that, but that's the really cool thing is that there's so many influences. And like in the second May Young Classic, they brought Mako Satomura. Watching her wrestle live, if you ever get the opportunity, masterclass, she and I are the same age. She's two months younger than me. And she's out there fighting Mercedes Martinez and like giving like rising scorpion kicks to people. And I'm just like, um, me next, please. <laughs> I can't wrestle, but you know what? I will let you, I will let you ragdoll me and throw me down some stairs. I, and it's fine. And then uh, Hiroyo Matsumoto, who is also in the second May Young Classic. She is one of the queens of the indies. Like she, she does stuff in Sendai Girls. She works in Oz Academy and a bunch of and freelances in a lot of different places. And also, for those who have been to Japan and have been to Minoru Suzuki's clothing store, he has Minoru Suzuki, everyone's favorite murder grandpa, the Suzuki Incident guy, has his own private clothing line in his own private shop in Harajuku. I have to ask you, what companies do you think should receive credit for showcasing Japanese Joshi wrestlers? in their companies. I know AEW has tried to show more diversity in terms of Japanese wrestlers, I should say, but do you think WWE should be given credit or Impact should be given credit for the superstars that they've been able to secure from Japan? It's kind of a mixed bag. I would say, of course, WWE needs to get some semblance of credit purely because, you know, they got Asuka. Asuka, when she, before she was signed, she was also running her own promotion by the way, she was running her own shows in Japan. Like she had Kana Puro Wrestling. That like, that's her, all her putting together cards. And she trained some people before coming over here. Kairi Sane, of course, Io Shirai, they got Saray. So yeah, they get some credit. Mm-hmm. Shimmer Pro Wrestling does not get enough credit because Shimmer was also 
they brought Kana over before Kana was signed by WWE mm. and made into Asuka. Mm-hmm. They also had Mia Yim. Mercedes I remember Martinez. when, yes, I remember when uh, Mia all, Yim and All Mercedes- the girls Sh- went through mm-hmm. Shimmer and Shimmer does not get enough love. I, I've heard that Shimmer has a streaming service. Now I'm just like, man, I might need to drop some money and just go watch, do some deep cuts and watch some old wrestling. AEW, of course, they deserve some credit. And I, I believe Kenny Omega was the one who was leading the charge with the Joshi talent. They had a unique circumstance because they were they were off to a great start. They had Rio, Rio became champion. They had Yuka mm-hmm. Sakazaki as one of the first people they brought over. They got Maki Ito. They got Emi Sakura, who is like, she also runs her own promotion, Chaco Pro, I believe it's called, or Gato Move. It's one of the two. But then like they fell victim to the pandemic because with Japan, when the pandemic happened, je- they shut the borders. Right. And then it was nobody in or out. So when they did the, uh, I believe it's the intern- the women's eliminator tournament, they had the Japanese bracket. They actually flew mm-hmm. Hikaru Shida home so she could produce and run that part of the tournament because due to COVID restrictions and questionable Japanese uh, immigration policy, if you were a Japanese national, you could still come and go in and out of the country. You just had to quarantine. But if you were a foreign national with a work visa or a married to a Japanese national, or a you know a family member of a Japanese or of a work visa holder or a Japanese national, and you left the country, you, you couldn't could come back. Get, you couldn't go back in. Oh my gosh! So there were families that went home for the holidays and have been separated for over a year and a half. There have been international students that were admitted and have had to spend their entire Japan study abroad experience in Zoom meetings in the middle of the night because of time zone differences because they will not be allowed in the country. When it, ca- it came to New Japan, you know, having their talent go o- to to Japan, or the American-based talent, including mm-hmm. Kenta. Kenta get, get, kind of gets around it because he's a Japanese national who lives here in Florida. He's been able to go in and out multiple times. But the problem is, is that with, like, the other guys here, like, you know, the David Finleys, the Juice Robinsons, the Tamatangas, who are all doing Impact and New Japan Strong, mm-hmm. If they go over to Japan, they're stuck. They, they one, they have to quarantine for two weeks. It's been put down to ten. I think it's down to seven now. It's going to be going down to three very soon if it hasn't already. But it was one of those they would go over there, but then they were worried about leaving. So you would go over there thinking you're going to do a, like a, a month and a half tour, six weeks, and then you get stuck over there for three weeks or sorry, three months. Like oh God bless gosh. Robbie Eagles from Australia. He went back there in the summertime. And then finally went home in January. He was gone half a year because they were worried that if he went back to Australia, Australia was another one that was shutting their borders all the time. And wow. not just within the country. I mean, like international borders, they, like different states were like, no, you can't leave. You, you come here, you, you stay here. Right. And when you're trying to book a promotion, you can't, you, you can't take a risk like that. But then it's like, is the booking more important that, than that person's family than watching their kids get born, you know, having a healthy relationship with their wife or their partner, or you know, it's one of those things that people had to pick and choose. And by the time with stardom, once a pandemic hit, all the international talents are, and they pretty much minus B Priestley, they, all of them, I think had to go home mm-hmm. to their respective countries because the other problem is that there, there is nationalized healthcare, but it's one of those things like if you don't have the language support in that country, do you want to risk going to, uh, hopefully, um, I mean, these companies, thankfully, they have people who are fluent enough and bilingual enough that, you know, can take care of them. But do you want to have to worry about possibly getting an infectious disease or a virus that could possibly kill you and you're thousands upon thousands of miles away from home? I feel or like have to so undergo, stressful. Or, or, you know, and because then you're worrying about homesickness, right. mental health physical health, you know, there's the added pressure of, you know, not wanting to be a burden upon somebody else. So it's one of those things, like, thankfully, they're easing the, the restrictions. But the problem is, is that the, the most questionable theme that's been going on is that why is the government of Japan basing their immigration policies on why are they letting Japanese nationals only in when a virus doesn't pick and choose? They, they, can't, yeah. they, can't, they can't discern between a foreigner and a Japanese national. If you're in the sphere of infection, you're in the sphere of infection. That's it. So it, it's one of those things like hopefully we're moving back to a time where there will be more fluid coming and going. And I think part of the struggle that AEW has right now is that on top of Sheeta getting injured, because I think she injured her knee, mm-hmm. Kenny is also out with multiple surgeries right now. So there isn't anyone to run the Joshi portion as a liaison because, you know, he's fluent enough in Japanese and he also has Michael Nakazawa that they can work with DDT and Tokyo Joshi Pro, which that's 
that that's the the company in Japan that they're pulling a majority of these talent in from. But it's also you run the risk of they come here and then they're they get, stuck. And they get they get stuck, but they also because you get sick here. Mm-hmm. And we don't, you know, what about the the hospital bills? What like how are they who's gonna take care of them if they're like living it out, out of hotel rooms and they're not in a house where they're gonna quarantine? So it's one of those things like it's a very tricky situation. But the problem is, is that some people are taking the approach, well, the pandemic's over. It's not over, guys. I work at a school of medicine. It's very much not over. <laughs> right. I am not a doctor. I'll say that that much. But we still have a social obligation to be aware of more than just ourselves. Because there are people who are immunocompromised. There are people that, you know, because they're immunocompromised, can't get vaccinated. We have to be kinder and think beyond that, especially if you're if you're someone who's choosing to go to shows. I know people don't want to wear masks, especially when it's like summertime and it's really hot and abysmal. But at the same time, all it takes is one person for one event to be a super spreader. Who are some of the top Joshi wrestlers that you would recommend a novice like myself to watch? And what companies would you recommend that I start with? All right. So a lot of the Joshi promotions, they do have YouTube pages where they upload free matches or a digested version of their programming. Stardom World, or sorry, Stardom has one. Sendai Girls has one. I believe Marvelous and Seedling, and there are several others. They also have YouTube pages. Start there. Go in and type Joshi Wrestling or, you know, Mako Satomura. You type Mako Satomura, she's been wrestling for over 20 years. You're going to get a whole bunch of stuff. Same thing with Asuka, Kyrie, Io. You can start with them. If you w- watch the Max and Mayon Classic and you see that you like, you think, mm, who else is there? I know Wikipedia isn't the most reliable source, but you can start there because it, they have a big block of names at the bottom. It's like, oh, like who's Evie? Evie is Dakota Kai. She went over there. And then, you know, there was a, a few years ago, uh, Sasha Banks went mm-hmm. to Japan. I remember she- that. She did not compete anywhere, but she went. She to trained. Mako, she trained in Mako Satomura's gym with Millie McKenzie. And I believe, uh, oh God, what is her name? She's from Australia. She's absolutely lovely. And it, her name escapes me and I'm terribly sorry. Charlie, Charlie Evans. That's mm. what it is. She was doing a death match stuff. She was doing the death matches. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, you know, if you want to go even deeper, there's always been that, you know, in different promos, there's been mentioned that, you know, Natalia had time in Japan. Becky Lynch had time in Japan before they both, you know, they met in Japan before they ever, you know, came to WWE. They went to Japan and I believe they cycled through Shimmer before they cycled to WWE. Bailey. I didn't know that. I did see Bailey. Yes. Because Bailey looks exactly the same. That girl's a vampire. (laughs) I'm convinced. She has not aged. She looks exactly like all she had was a haircut. That was it. (laughs) Tell us your secrets, Bailey. Please. Those would be the ones I would recommend starting with. I mean, Asuka, please. You could chase up all kinds of stuff. You, there, I believe there's actually video of a mixed mixed tag match featuring Asuka, or as Kana, Minoru Suzuki, and Mako Satomura. Mm. All in one place. I'll have to I, check that Asuka one out. Yeah. Has, as Kana has also teamed with Kenny Omega in a mixed tag match. A very skinny, junior heavyweight, cruiserweight bodied. Kenny Omega with very, very blonde hair. It's like baby Omega. It's like it's, a, it's like little Kenny. Fresh off the plane from Canada, Kenny. <laughs> it's very cute. But I mean, all, all it takes is a couple of keystrokes. I mean, if it helps, once this episode goes up, I mean, I'll chase up some stuff for you and we can just start, I'll just throw you some matches and be like, hey, start here. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of our listeners, like they've been listening to the Church of Joshi. You know, they've Joshi's so great. Alex yes. and Kayla are so great. They've started to kind of explore that avenue. But I think with all promotions, I think a lot of people, they get excited to watch something new, but they also don't know where to start. I know for me, like you know, I've seen Ring of Honor on TV before and I'm like, oh yeah, I'll watch it. But I, I never feel like I know exactly what's going on. I always feel like an outsider watching it. And I feel like a lot of people feel that way when it comes to like Joshi wrestling because they, they've they seen Asuka, they've seen Kyrie, So they, they kind of know like a little bit of the background, but I think people get nervous because they're like, well, I don't understand the commentary and I don't really know what's going on. I think people just feel outside of their element almost. Well, speaking of Ring of Honor, if for those who, you know, want to, you know, if you have Honor Club because they still have their archives up and available. And I mean, you don't even need your, their archives. You can go to their YouTube page and search these up. The Women of Honor Tournament 
from Supercard of Honor in 2019, the one that uh, Sumi Sakai ended up winning to become the first Women of Honor champion for the the new the newer belt design. Half of that bracket were girls from Stardom. Hana Kimura was in it. Kagetsu was in it. And Kagetsu retired uh, a year and a half ago. Hazuki was in it. Who and Hazuki only recently came back to Stardom in 2021. And of course, Sumi Sakai. She's Japanese. She's like. If she, if there was to be an actual bridge between United States wrestling scene and not just Joshi and Japan, it's Sumi Sakai. Because whenever New Japan also used to send the people over to Ring of Honor, she was the one who was like like setting up the meet and greet tables for them mm-hmm. and bringing the talent out. And I don't I don't say this about many people, but you know what? I don't trust anyone who doesn't like Sumi Sakai. She is one of the best people you will ever meet in this world. She loves everyone and everything. And she doesn't get enough credit. And she's retiring this year. So if you have an opportunity to watch Sumi wrestle, please do that before, because she hasn't announced a final date, but she said 2022 is the year. So mark your calendars, chase up. Uh, she's been on Bloodsport. Bloodsport's another great one. But yeah, I get it. It's one of those things like, it's just like getting into wrestling for the first time. You're like, mm-hmm. now there's so many options. Like, oh, I don't know where to start. Just kind of like Russian roulette. It just pick something and go with it and see where, mm-hmm. like, see where the rabbit hole takes you. It's one of those things like you can go on to Twitter or so or Instagram or whatever and ask people what what you recommend. And you know, you could ask one person, is this a good match? And you know, like like everything else, fifty percent will say it's good. Some people will say it's mediocre, and other people are like, no, it's the worst match. Why would you watch that match? Watch this match instead. So it's it's also you know like like everything else, it's. You have to worry about the gatekeeping. Yeah, you don't want to definitely. talk about gatekeeping, but every every sect within wrestling fandom and every fandom in general, they have their gatekeepers. Some of them can provide useful information, but if you feel that you're being gatekept by someone, you can find other avenues and other people within the community that can help direct you. We need more women fans who enjoy Joshi. Or sorry, we need more non-male fans who enjoy Joshi. Non-binaries, you're welcome. All, all of the, all the communities, come, please, come, come, join the Joshi Fun Wagon. It's a good time. Thank you so much, Karen, for joining me. Where can the people keep up with you on social media? For those who would like to follow along, I am on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube at Hey Karen Sensei. I also do some translation work for different articles that are in Japanese. I translate them into English. And usually I post those on Twitter for those who want to get more information. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wrestling Wind Down. You can find all of our other episodes available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at WWDCAST. And if you missed it, we now have Wrestling Wind Down merch. You can go buy yours at whatamaneuver.net. Let us know what you thought about the episode. What was your favorite part? Until next time, enjoy your wine and, of course, enjoy your wrestling. Cheers! Cheers.